Jin Chuan, you have to tell me when you're ready. I couldn't hear. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly <coughs> realize non-birth. Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Homage to the Blessed, Noble, and Perfectly Enlightened One. Ammo Saranto Suche Doye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshi. Ammo Saranto Suche Doye Olahudi San Miao San Putoshi. Okay, let's recite together. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Jie Nan Zhao Yu Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Okay, are you ready to recite together in English? Here we go. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound. Rarely is encountered, even in a million eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Shri Fu Shang Ren, Go Wei, Shri Shung, Da Jia, Omi To Fu. Howdy, everybody. Nice to see everyone in Berkeley, California, in the Gold Coast in Queensland and people who will be joining us later online through the miracles of modern technology. We have truly a global sutra lecture today. And let me show you all where I am. I'm in the new beautiful Buddha Hall at Gold Coast Dharma Realm with these three imposing beautiful images. This is now known as Shirangama Monastery. Let me show you our garden outside. Isn't that lovely? And here's the other side. And to continue the tour, here's the assembly. <laughs> we can wave to Berkeley and California. <laughs> so we have nearly as many friends here listening to the Dharma today as there are in Berkeley, <coughs> making it truly a global phenomenon. So what we're going to do we're looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, Huayanjing. And we've just begun the ninth stage, the ninth ground. So we're going to, uh, just to be consistent, I think we may have forgotten since uh, the last time we explained the ninth ground. We're going to start over with the... Uh, we're, we're only a few pages into it, so we're going to read through the section that we've already explained until we get up to where we left off last time, which was, I forget, was it the last lecture was December or something? Anybody recall? Anybody take notes? Who's got it? Connie? What's Connie's got the notes? There. What was the last lecture? December 1st. December 1st, okay. 
So, lovely. All right. Here, now, um, I'm going to pop up my sutra, and we've got Ben on the computer here. You want to go up to the very, very tip top, Ben? There's a page above you still. Or is that is that the tip top? No, that's it. That's it. Okay. So what I want is the Namo Dafang Guangfo. Yeah, keep going. Oh. We're working on it here. So this is the we're going to chant the invocation, which says homage to the Buddha's flower garland sutra of great expanded teachings. And the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Yeah, you found good. Can you make it bigger? Ah, there we go. And we've been doing it like a chant, like a. We've been doing it to a melody instead of simply reciting. And our our intention is to even. Doing it seven times, I do it six or eight, uh, get caught up in the moment. So the goal is to recite this together with everyone seven times. We do it in Chinese, which is the bottom half of this invocation. Well, we're still working on the English version, and that's a work in progress. <laughs> That's the melody. Like that. Okay, are we ready? Everybody got the melody, we've got the text. Uh, the important part is to get our hearts into the idea that if we are sincere in requesting the ocean-wide flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to draw near, uh, invisibly, they get the message in space and come to join our assembly. When Master Hua did this with us, you could believe that they came. There was no doubt that the light in the room <laughs> refined itself. It was a spiritual moment, to be sure. So how can we be anything less than sincere, right? Here we go. Namo da fang guang fu wa yen ji wa yen hai wei o pu sa namo da fang guang fu wa yen ji wa yen hai wei o pu sa Now, what you were listening to is a fretless, tack head banjo. Truly could be a relic made in another century. In fact, it's brand new, made by Nara the Mason down in 
Victoria, Australia. Isn't this a lovely instrument? It's really got that plunky, plunky sound. No frets, just like a cello, nylon strings. Perfect for invoking spiritual presence. All right, now my text. I hope we, this is interesting, we have a sutra text being shown here in the Gold Coast on a separate computer. We've got a sutra text being shown in Berkeley on a separate computer. And I've got my own text right here because of bandwidth problems, trying to get everything working. So we isolated the texts away from the, the webcast. So it's going to require us to, um, what's the word? Coordinate, I guess, our scrolling of the text. I'm currently on page 52 and 53. Right? And let's see. To do our method, let me recite... Uh, okay, let me do the first page myself in Chinese. What's difficult is coordinating the sequence because there's a time lag between this hemisphere and the, the northern hemisphere. So let me do the reciting of the Chinese and everyone can put their palms together if you care to do so. Follow along uh, silently yourself. Okay, here we go. It's D is where I'm going to start. All right, so please listen in. Here we go. D Jo D. Shorts Pusa Badi Shi Rulai Xian Da Shan Tong Li Chan Dong Shi Fang Zhu Guo Du Wu Liang Yi Shu Nan Si Yi Yi Che Zhi Jian Wu Shang Zun Chi Shan Fang 大自在王自在天供养人中大导师 Okay, we did it. We did page one in Chinese. Now, we're going to continue the same passage in English. And let's do it this way. Let's see if we can't do it in unison. I think reciting in unison is one of our best moments. Um, we've talked about it quite a bit. The value of reading together. You, we just don't get a chance to do that in public. When, when do you have a chance to recite together? Maybe when you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Commonwealth of Australia and to the Republic for... No, no, that's not right. Let's see. God save the Queen. So... Other than that, other than the, you know, put your palms, put your hand over your heart and recite the Pledge of Allegiance, we don't get a chance to recite together in public. And it's a very elegant, um, mm, what's the word, mm, cohesive, uh, connection-making public experience to simply put breath and words together from your voice as a group. It's really a powerful moment. When the text we're reciting is a Buddha Sutra, the wisdom of the Buddha, 
it's even more so. So with that in mind, I would like to invite all of you to join me in reciting together just that section of text that we did. So Ben and Invisible Text Manipulator in Berkeley, page 53, the ninth stage, I'm going to put my palms together. These are the words of the Buddha. And let's read, paying attention to the punctuation. As we say, the punctuation is your friend when you're reciting together because it tells us how to breathe, where to pause, where to stop, where to start. All right? We're going to start with the ninth stage and then do just then. Here we go. Ready? The ninth stage. Just then, comma, after the eighth stage had been explained, comma, the Tathagatas showed their amazing spiritual abilities, quaking lands throughout the ten directions, countless kotis in number and difficult to imagine. The unsurpassed honored ones, comma, pause, omniscient and all-seeing, their bodies sending forth magnificent radiance everywhere, illumine those countries, limitless in number, so that all those beings might gain peace and happiness. Limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis of bodhisattvas simultaneously elevated into the air and hovered there, and they offered gifts of utmost wonder, surpassing all in the heavens to the ones supreme among all speakers. The heart of the Deva King from the Maheshvara heaven and the hearts of every God, filled with joy that knew no bounds. They each made offerings to the profound sea of merit and virtue of substantial numbers of items. Furthermore, comma, celestial maidens, millions of kotis in number, their bodies and minds filled with surpassing joy. Each played limitlessly many kinds of music as an offering to the great guiding master among humans. Okay, pause there. Thank you for that. Ninth stage, Flower Garland Sutra, a very large Buddhist text. Um, our tradition says spoken by the Buddha, but not in person, not from his own mouth, but he deputa, deputized, he appointed a spokesperson, another Buddha, to speak it for him. And we are in one of the longest of the chapters of the 40 chapters of that sutra. It's called the Ten Stages. We're almost done. This is the ninth stage, so we're nine out of ten. And we've been at this now for over five years uh, on this one chapter, because it's quite long. And by golly, we're nearly done. So that's what we're about. The topic of our sutra is bodhisattvas, awakened beings, people who are awoke, that's already a new word in our culture, awoke. And the Buddhists have been using this word for a long time, applying, applying it to people, humans, not any other kind of superhero or uncommon individual or some non-human, but people like you, like me, like your mom, people like your boss, maybe. Um, people who wake up to their connections with other beings. That's what we wake up to, is the fact that this broken individual unit of a body is an illusion. That, in fact, there's nothing that separates us but our thoughts. So the text is about how to use bodhisattva-like thoughts to see through that illusion of separateness and brokenness and aloneness and to find through your cultivation of what are called bodhisattva practices, find ways to make that ideal vision your reality. 
so that every action you take, every word you speak, every thought that rises in the mind is beneficial to self and others. Every word, thought, and deed overcomes that gap between me and everybody outside me. Those strangers who make me feel so lonely and alienated. The Bodhisattva no longer operates from that paradigm of I'm alone and afraid in a world I never made and I'm kind of a victim here and that's my motive for my behavior is how to get the best for me in that situation. Not anymore. The Bodhisattva has a very different uh, perspective on his and her relationship to not just other humans, but to all living things. And the Chinese have a name for it. It's called Tong Ti Da, a same body, great compassion. Okay, that's where we are. That's our chapter. We're way into it, ninth stage. And what we just read, this section right here, is the prelude, setting the stage. Oh my goodness. Uh, I keep, when I read this, when I hear other people read it, I think of movies. I just, I, if this were cinematic, can you imagine how, <laughs> how the camera, now it would have a drone, right? The drone would be flying by and you'd see the aerial view. And the eighth stage has been explained and the Buddhas, the Tathagatas, showed their abilities by making earthquakes happen, not three point somethings on the Hayward Fault under the UC Berkeley football stadium only, that too, but they make the earth quake in six ways, it says here in all ten directions, harmlessly, haha, -ha. harmlessly. Huh. So the US Geological Survey doesn't have to worry and yet the earthquakes, funny. There's, that's a, a, we explained this passage earlier as being what you call sheng gongda, surpassing excellent merit and virtue. When it's time to speak a sutra, nature rejoices, they say, because we're going to hear a lot of truth spoken. And nature has a preference for unchanging truth. So the earthquakes are a celebration. What happens next? The unsurpassed honored ones, omniscient and all-seeing, hmm, their bodies send forth magnificent radiance, shine that light on limitless countries so that all beings get happy. All right. That's our next scene. What's going on? The Buddhas release light from their bodies. Can you imagine that? How would that, would that, it'd probably be better animated <clears throat> than the CGI. We get uh, Hayao Miyazaki and his team of animators from Japan to do hand, hand illumination, hand painted scenes of unsurpassed honored ones <laughs> sending forth magnificent radiance. Can you see it? Woo, I would love it see that cartoon and the light shines on worlds and beings in those worlds get happy because there's this incredible light so I imagine where the light abides shadows are gone right darkness is gone um, Where shadows and darkness are gone, people have to come into the light. Doing shadowy dark things doesn't survive. Everything you do is seen. And you know what that's like. You, you tend to be a little more straight up when everybody's watching. You know you're not going to get away with little meannesses, right? So. Live limitless hundreds of thousands of kotis of bodhisattvas, what do they do? <whistles> Rose up in the air and hovered in the air, hovercraft bodhisattvas. And they're in the air 
they made gifts of utmost wonder surpassing gifts that the devas can make to who to the ones what does it say in chinese to people who are supreme among all speakers oh boy check that out i really like that that um here's the scene we're beginning the chapter this is all celebration this is all kind of setting the stage for the main act which is speaking of the dharma and we've seen buddhas now quaking the earth and sending out light we've seen people receiving light and being delighted being made happy now bodhisattvas show up and they rise up in the air okay what the sutras say they have this ability in chinese martial arts is called qinggong they You've seen it in, in uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, right? That Lee An film was the first first time millions of millions of Western moviegoers saw something that Chinese martial arts film friends have seen forever, which is qinggong, the ability to to fly as part of your martial arts gong fu. So the bodhisattvas here are doing that. And they're giving offerings to speakers, to Dharma speakers. Sure, I'd be happy to accept utmost wonders, gifts surpassing all in the heavens to speakers. It's nice to have the Dharma speakers honored here. Um, speaking of which, recently, um, Leon Bibb, um, one of our best folk singers in America, uh, a son, father and son, uh, recently issued a new collection of songs from everywhere called, what was it called? Universal Griot or Griot to the World. What's a griot? G R I O T. I'm going to open a new. We need a new um, notes page. Here we go. This is a word I want people to know about. Griot, French, right? And griot, you guys can't see my deck, my desktop here. So, here we go. Save this is my notes page. Nobody can see my desktop. Gee, why am I making notes here? Okay, a griot, G-R-I-O-T, looks like griot, right? Not, it's French, griot. A griot is a storyteller who keeps alive the tradition of the tribe. And they are, this tradition is most prevalent in West Africa, places like Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia, places like that, where many of those individuals who were uprooted by the slave trade, uh, the ships arrived there on the coastal West Africa and came to, to the West. The griots in the tribe remembered, and it was their job to sing the story of the tribe for the entire history of the tribe. Um, they played instruments like the Kora, K-O-R-A, and in fact, in uh, Leon Bibb's uh, album, there's a Kora player. Kora is a West African instrument with something like 35 strings or 28 strings. And playing the Kora and these, these African rhythms they would tell the story of our tribe from the start. In the beginning, they would sing, right? Was the great progenitor King Ramabhamipal. And he was a great king, and he was great in his leadership, and he was great in his fatherhood, and he was great in his cow herding. And from him issued forth hundreds of offspring. Their names were, right? and the griot starts. 
and you get the entire story of the tribe. And these singers, storytellers, historians of the tribe would start today and finish on Wednesday, having sung nonstop from the past to the present day, telling the names of who begat who and who begat who and who begat who and what war was fought and who won and who lost and what was given to the victorious tribe as a tribute and how many calves came from this particular cow and so forth, right? You get the point. So griot tell the story of the tribe. Here is Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva, who is the, you could say without exaggeration, the griot of the Ten Stages chapter. He's telling the story of Bodhisattvas from stage one all the way up to stage 10. We're now at nine. So here is recognition of those speakers. Why? We're not done. We're only at stage nine. We've got more to go. There's more to learn here. And the bodhisattvas are like saying, please don't stop. Tell us what we came to hear. We want to know the Dharma of the ninth stage. Kind sir, please do speak. Right? How cool is that? They're making offerings to the ones supreme among all speakers. Okay. The camera shifts up to the heavens to the king of the devas from the Maheshvara heaven. Maha Ishvara. There's something called elision in Sanskrit. You put two vowels together and they shift. So Maha and Ishvara become Maheshvara. So the heart of the Deva king from the Da Zi Zai Tian, that's who uh, Maheshvara is, he's a special god in between two realms. That's a story for another time, but um, it's What's happening is there's the desire realm heavens, six of them. There's the form realm heavens, 28 of them. And in between, there's a funny kind of liminal heaven in between the two realms where Ishvara and Maheshvara, Ishvara and big Ishvara live. And Master Hua Shurfu always described them as uh, arrogant, he said. They are just very full of themselves. They ride around on these white oxen up in the heavens, and they have three eyes, he said, and they're very unusual. They're, they go back and forth between desire realm and the Brahma realm, where things are very different. The Brahma, the Fan Tian, devas there are in Samadhi all the time. They're in the Dhyanas. They're already Ru Chan Ding, right? They're in the Dhyanas. They're pure. They don't have desire thoughts as much. Down in the desire realm, oh my goodness, that sixth realm is where who? Mara, the tempter, the murderer, where Satan lives, just like in the book of Job, interestingly enough, uh, for those of you who are following such things. So he goes back and forth between them, and the sutra points him out right here. The heart of the Deva king from the Maheshvara heaven and the hearts of every other god there, filled with joy that knew no bounds. Oh, good, they're thinking. Oh, good, we get to hear the ninth stage. They, in turn, make offerings to the profound sea of merit and virtue, Buddha. That's a sobriquet, that's a title, profound sea of merit and virtue. Shen Shen Gong De Hai. They make offerings to him of Substantial numbers of items, lots of stuff. They make offerings. Okay. Next, the camera continues to shift. It's panning around the heavens as we prepare to hear about the ninth ground. And what comes up next? Beyonce. There she is with her marching band and a choir of hundreds, millions of kotis in number, bodies and minds filled with joy, 
playing limitlessly many kinds of music as an offering to the another title, Ren Zhong Da Dao Shi, among humans, the great guiding master. Okay, there we go. That's the first page. Boy, are you breathless already? I mean, this all this preparation. How amazing. Can you see Beyonce out there with filling up the stadium? She is uh, maybe America's cultural leader in terms of music and and uh, actually Beyonce uh, just for what it's worth is worth a lot noting um, America has this annual um, music festival called Coachella down in Indio California way out in the desert and this last year Beyonce was the headliner and she got up on the stage and performed for two hours, two and a half hours, I believe, without a break, um, giving a complete run-through of African-American music in all its glory and the contributions that it made um, to the audience there in a what's called a tour de force. There was nothing like it, I think, in in American history, musical entertainment history. So you could say, in an interesting kind of way, I haven't had these thoughts before, I guess, but Beyonce uh, Knowles gave a griot's presentation surveying all of music that uh, she draws from, telling the story, telling the musical story, and as a result saying, we are here. This is where we are, given where we've been. That's the job of the, gri the griot. So to have uh, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva <coughs> being requested to serve in that role, what the devas and the bodhisattvas here are asking is not the story of our tribe, so to speak, they're saying, give us the story, the history of wisdom and compassion. Take us all the way back to the start, not so much historically, but personally, is that the word? Essentially, show us where the bodhisattva resolve arises in my heart. That's really what they're asking for, because, number one, they trust he can and that he will, if they're sincere, but when Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva has explained this thoroughly, they become empowered to serve as Bodhisattvas themselves. Key, I think that's a key point, I want to underline that underscore that, which is what? That one of the qualities I like the most about the Buddha Dharma that I have never seen in any theistic religion, any religion where there's a deva or a god or a supreme being, is I've never seen another religion that says, if you cultivate and practice, you do so with the expectation that you will replace the founder of the religion. Buddhism says that. These bodhisattvas who are getting ready to hear the Dharma fully expect that if they can get what, what not Samantabhadra, what Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva is teaching, that they will become him, or they will go beyond him and become a Buddha. <coughs> That's their hope. That's their expectation. How interesting. That's a promise in Buddhism that anybody who sets out on the path, if they follow it, 
vigorously, reliably, effectively, they will get to the source of the power of the teaching. They become the authority themselves. And the Buddha is simply a placeholder, right? Who is the Buddha? The Buddha is a title for a person who did what every Buddha before him or her did, transformed from consciousness to wisdom, and became a Buddha, and entered nirvana to be replaced by another Buddha. Title, placeholder, right? That's a really different perspective on who holds the power in the religion. Okay, you, I don't want to flog that horse too much, but you get the idea. Okay, we are... Um, all of you page turners, are we ready? You go back to our text. I'm now on page 54 and 55. From here on, having read the Chinese already, I'm just going to do the English until we get to the place where we left off. So, uh, Winnie, are you the minder here? You want to take us to page 55? There's a comment here. Sam says, Beyonce is a vegan. I didn't know that. All right. Good for her. She would have to be. How else could she perform for two and a half hours without a, without a break? It's on YouTube. Anybody who's curious about what she did, it's worth watching. It's She's a vegan. No wonder. Nanguai. Okay. So what are we going to do? We're going to read down. We're going to read down all of page 55 like we did page 53. Okay, are we ready? Join me if you'd care to and put my palms together. Here we go. Mind the punctuation. Here we go. At that time, the many varieties of music played in harmony, hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many kinds, all through the well-gone one's awesome spiritual might, expressed these wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim. Okay, here's a quote coming up, ready? The calm and gentle, free from defilement and harm, cultivates this practice skillfully wherever he goes. His mind, like empty space, reaches all places in ten directions, extensively explaining the Buddha's way and awakening all beings. Okay, next paragraph, here we go. Everywhere in the heavens and among humans as well, he makes adornments appear incomparably fine, all born from the Tathagata's merit and virtue, an inspiring delight for the Buddha's wisdom in those who see them. Continue. Without leaving this one place, he travels to many lands, as the moon shines everywhere, illuminating the world. For him, voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still, just as an echo sounds everywhere through a valley, equally without fail. For living beings whose minds are lowly and base, he explains the practices of a sound hearer. If their minds are sharp and clear and they admire Pracheka Buddhas, he tells them of the way of the middle vehicle. Okay, good. So there, we just did a page. Let's just go quickly through it. <coughs> okay, the Devis, the female residents of the heavens, the Deva women, played lots of music, many varieties, in harmony. Hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many kinds. Wow. Can you imagine how that would sound? All through the well-gone one's awesome spiritual mind. Well-gone one, title of the Buddha. We're getting a lot of uh, Buddha titles here. Expressed these wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim. Okay, so it was vocal music as well as or, uh, instrumental music. The sutra is going to show us 
what they sang. They make it clear that it was praise music. And I want to take just a second here to talk about that. One of the glories of my own Methodist upbringing, and anybody who is a Methodist, here in Australia, Methodism is called the Uniting Church. I like that. If only, right? If, if they would step into that name, it would be a better, better world indeed, uh, even more than they do. So one of the best parts of being a Methodist was the music. Oh my goodness. A couple of the founders of the Christian Protestant sect known as Methodism were Charles Wesley and John Wesley, his brother. And they apparently didn't sleep very much because the, their output of Christian hymns just goes on forever and forever and forever. They wrote an astonishing number of hymns that got collected into the Christian hymnal. And we would wait on Sunday morning for those hymns to come around because they were so uh, refreshing and clean and straightforward praise of the Lord. So that's um, one Protestant sect grew up particularly in England, came to the West. If you go deeper into Judaism, you find the Psalms in the Older Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. And the Psalms are songs. P-S-A-L-M translates as S-O-N-G. And many of them, not all of them, are attributed to King David, <clears throat> one of the great historical figures in classical Judaism. And he was no slouch either. That's not a respectful way to say it. He was outstanding in his ability to praise God. And so if anybody has a copy of the Holy Bible around at home uh, and you got time, just pick it up, turn to Psalms, P-S-A-L-M-S, and read the variety of songs gathered together. Do you, Ben, how many? Are there 530 oh, Psalms? Yeah. 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 Um, you will be surprised at their variety. They're not all praise. What do we have, including, however, that's the source of our famous 23rd Psalm, right? Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, and that's a wonderful praise. It's probably the most popular one of all. Um, there are also laments, sadness in the, among the Psalms. There are some terrifying psalms that are bloodthirsty, where they say, smite mine enemy, God, grind his bones to dust, right? Like that, kind of very violent. But the flavor is, these are, this is the voices heard from a, uh, not a 20th, 21st century, you know, uh, liberal, perspective, socially progressive, not. This is prehistoric tribes, many of them uh, wanderers, many of them Bedouins out in the desert. And life was brutal. And you needed help. God, you wanted to talk to God because he would keep your tribe alive a little longer, often as you were going to war with a stronger tribe. You prayed for his help. So whatever the social conditions were that led to the Psalms, the Psalms survive. So again, the stories of the tribe, the griot, gathered the songs of, of King David among the Psalms. You can find them there. Okay, John Wesley, Charles Wesley, gathered together hundreds and hundreds of praises, a lot less bloodthirsty, I might add, because this was now uh, 
the Protestant Reformation happened and a lot of the uh, nitty-gritty of early Judaism and Roman Catholicism got expunged for uh, in, in the making of Christianity. That's in Protestantism. That's a story for another time. Nonetheless, the music survives. And goodness, think about Christmas carols, right? We love those Christmas carols. We've written our own Buddha carols that we trot out every winter, every Christmas time. <coughs> they are the products of that very same tradition. Okay, what's the point? Our sutra has deva women praising the Buddha, praising the thus the well gone one, the thus come one, praising what are the other titles? We've got the well gone one. We have the what was he? The great guiding master among humans. We have the unsurpassed honored ones. These deva women playing varieties of music and harmony, hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many, are praising. Okay, what about the Buddhists? We've got praise, tradition in Buddhism. Here's the Avatamska Sutra taking us into the song they're going to sing to praise the Buddha. What do we have? In the Pure Land tradition, oh my goodness, on and on and on, all these wonderful songs and praise, including some that we have written, some that Master Hua has written. Last night here in the Buddha Hall, we sang, I'm really lucky to study Buddhism because last life I planted good seeds. Now in this life I've met good friends and a good knowing one to teach me deep wisdom. There's Master Hua contributing a song to the praise tradition, right? So, yeah, Buddhism is definitely in that line of spiritual traditions. Uh, Samantabhadra Bodhisattva says, Chang Zan Rulai, praise the thus come one. That's something we should be doing, he says. Okay, these deva women expressed wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim and said, what? They said, the calm and gentle one. There's a word missing there. The calm and gentle one, who is free from defilement and harm, cultivates this practice skillfully wherever, let's swap the pronoun out, she, wherever she goes. Her mind, like empty space, reaches all places in ten directions, extensively explaining the Buddha's way and awakening all beings. Somehow, I've never heard a Christian hymn praising God for having a mind like empty space. You know, I think that would just pick it up. I mean, why not? Let's, let's get some let's do a little, you know, overlapping those traditions. I would like to hear God's mind explained as reaching all places in ten directions like empty space. Sure, why not? Extensively explaining the Buddha's way. Continue more verses from the Devi's praise. Everywhere in the heavens and here among people, he makes adornments appear that are incomparably fine, makes beautiful things show up, born from the Tathagata's merit and virtue, and making people who see them happy. What would an adornment that appears be? How about kindness? Um, have you ever, do you know anybody in your life ever strike you as having kind eyes? Yeah? Um, we were at Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary a couple weeks ago um, up in Brisbane, and they had a barking owl in the free flight bird show. And this barking owl has these round yellow eyes with black pupils, big and round, and they are not kind at all. Barking owls have these raptor eyes. There is no mercy in a barking owl's expression as he 
zeroes in on a mouse. Oh my God. There's just this, you know, they are heartless and scary. And then I looked into the eyes yesterday of a king parrot as she was eating out of the palm of my hand. And the eyes of the king parrot were innocent. There was just this joy, you know, hi. I, I can't imitate the king parrot. I'm trying to give you the, you know. But it was like this, just this innocent, simple, transparent kindness, just, you know, and no nastiness. I suppose if I were a, a bird seed, I might be afraid of the king parrot, but they're seed eaters, they're vegetarians, you know, and you got these curved beaks for pulling seeds out of, out of flowers, and just so different. So can you imagine, just among bird species, you can see the difference in nature reflected in their eyes. What would it be like to look into the Buddha's eyes? Kindness, just this deep, 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 deep well of kindness. You know there's no harm coming to you from that being, right? Born from the Buddhas, the Tathagatas, merit and virtue. And when you see that kindness, you think, I want to have that wisdom. I want to be as wise as the Buddha. <coughs> okay, the praise continues. We're into the song. This is song lyrics from the Deva women singing. They say, we think the Buddha is cool because he travels to many lands but never leaves this place where he is. He can travel to many lands without leaving his seat. How? Just like the moon shines everywhere, illuminating the world. Speaking of which, good timing, it is a blood moon tonight, full moon. Uh, it's the one of the closest approaches to the earth of the moon in the calendar year is tonight. So this is the lunar 15th. We, uh, is that not yet where you guys are, right, Berkeley? Coming up. It's January 20th here, Sunday. Um, so let's see. Do you, anybody know? Do you, Jin Chuan, do you have the, the full moon tonight? Today's the 14th here. What, say I mean, again? The, 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 um, what do you call it? The lunar 14th. So it's, okay, so tomorrow, tomorrow I think it's the full moon. Mm. Okay, yeah, so you consider probably. yourselves warned and prepared. Yeah. Okay, coming up. Ours is tonight. Uh, we're already at 2.30 in the afternoon. So, okay, the way the full blood moon shines equally on a bowl of water held anywhere on the earth, simultaneously that if the moon is up, all the teacups will, will catch the moon. Likewise, for him, Voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still. Okay, another analogy. The way an echo responds to every part of a valley at the same time. Hello, 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 hello. There's no edge of the valley that doesn't get the sound of the hello. Right? So echoes. Nice natural images. Moon. Echoes in the valley. Um, check out this point. The mind's thoughts all fall still. Today in our meditation class, we were talking about what's supposed to happen when you meditate. That was our topic today. And it's a question that many, 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 many Beginners and even intermediates, when they get a chance to talk to the monk, they kind of slide up and say, well, you know, I've been meditating and uh, I'm not supposed to think, right? They say. And what's supposed to happen? And the stuff that's going on shouldn't be happening, right? What's the question? Where does it arise from? It, be it arises because meditation is invisible. There's no yardstick by which to measure whether I'm doing it right or not, right? So 
I was saying today, and I won't go into the whole thing because we're lecturing on the sutra, but the point I made today for our meditation class was that it's useful and helpful to think of the mind, that thing that keeps interfering when I'm trying to meditate, think of it as just another of the six senses one of the other five senses, just like the eyes, just like the ears, nose, tongue, skin, the body, right? No different, which is what? You don't have to look twice to see what's in front of you. You don't have to listen twice to hear what's around you. Your eyes work just fine the first time. Why do we allow our minds to think and then think again and then to judge and evaluate how we thought and then react emotionally to the judgment and the evaluation of the thought, contemplating the thought that we originally had? Four steps away, we're still overusing this sense called the mind. The Chinese would point there. They would say, Xin, that mind right there. It's enough to use the mind once and move on. We tend to be head-heavy people, even more so as we have these devices, these gadgets, right? These catch our eyes for hours and hours and our thumbs and little else. We forget our bodies even exist as we absorb into our smartphones. Our heads get heavier even. Meditation, for him, voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still. That doesn't mean he doesn't think. It means he doesn't think twice. He, she, the Buddha, doesn't comment on his or her thinking process. Once is sufficient. And he moves on. As a result, he is authentically alive in his entire skanda body. His body and mind are equally awake and sensitive and responsive and present in the moment. Because he has shrunk his head. The Buddha, through meditation, has become his own head shrinker. Right? <clears throat> he has allowed thoughts to rise and fall the way sights enter and leave. Sounds enter and leave. How interesting, right? Meditation, one reason to meditate would be to get to that place where your thoughts rise and fall, followed by silence. Voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still. How happy we would be without the chatter without the editor, without the critic in there, chewing away at us, burning up our gasoline, right? Okay. All right. Moving forward into our praise. We're still in a song. These are song lyrics. The devas, devis are singing. For living beings whose minds are lowly and base, he explains the practices of a sound hearer. If their minds are sharp or clear, they are Pracheka Buddhas, solitary Buddhas, and they get to hear the middle vehicle. Okay, little bit of Mahayana polemic there, friends. The that the Avatamsaka is not free of that, interestingly. This is there are other Buddhist sutras. If you look at the Vajra Sutra, the Diamond Sutra. They, there are voices at the end that says, anybody who slanders this will fall into the hells and will have big trouble. Right? So there's an editorial voice popping out in the sutra. Likewise, in the Avatamsaka, there is a steady criticism of people whose minds are like what are called the two vehicles. What does that mean? People who, within Buddhism, seek their own liberation and stop. 
That's considered an inferior use of the mind. And there's an edge here. It's interesting, Ben. There's a little bit of a, you know, polemic. If your minds are lowly and base, you get to hear about sound hearers. Okay, flop right over to the Theravada tradition, the Thai forest tradition. They call themselves the sound hearer sangha, sawaka sango, and they they're proud of being the voice hearer assembly, the sound hearer. They hear the sound of the Buddha's voice and awaken to the way. They don't go forward to say, and we liberate all living beings from suffering. The Abhatamsaka says, that's not the whole story. You have sold out. You've only gotten part of the spirit of the Dharma. Critical. Interesting, huh? If they're living beings whose minds are xia lie, lower and inferior, they get to hear about the sheng wen hung, the Four Noble Truths. They don't hear about the paramitas. Okay, there it is. Why try to apologize for it? There it is. Critique of the Theravada. Okay. In contrast to our team, right? Now we're on page 57. Winnie, 57. Okay. We're going to go down to the end of the song. And then the, we're going to do three three paragraphs. Okay, right here. Ready? Anybody want to join me? Um, page Turner, page 57. Okay, English. Here we go. If they have kindness and compassion and like to benefit others, he tells them of the deeds performed by bodhisattvas. If their minds aspire to the utmost supreme wisdom, he reveals the unsurpassed dharma of the Tathagatas. Just as a magician conjures up all sorts of things of different shapes and features, yet none of it is real, the Bodhisattva's wisdom magic in the same way brings everything into being, free from both existence and non-existence. As these millions of beautiful sounds finish their praises of the Buddha, they suddenly fell still. Muna Liberation said, now this multitude has been purified. Please describe the way practiced upon the ninth stage. Okie doke. End of the song. Two more verses. If they have kindness and compassion and like to benefit others, that's the A-team. Those are the bodhisattvas. We like them, says the sutra. Furthermore, there's another vehicle if their minds aspire to the utmost supreme wisdom, the Buddha talks about the path of Buddhahood. Okay, so four sages. One, sound hearers. Two, Pracheka Buddha, solitary Buddhas. Three, Bodhisattvas. Four, Buddhas. <coughs> so together, we have what are called the six paths of rebirth. We're in the human realm, I'm assuming, anybody in those devas who are listening in. So we've got six paths of rebirth that are part of samsara, rebirth, transmigration, coming back. There are four paths beyond rebirth. Voice hearers or sound hearers, pracheka Buddhas, solitary Buddhas, bodhisattvas and Buddhas. Technically speaking, the sound hearers, the arhats, come back seven times or one time. But their birth and death, blown by karma, is over for them. Okay. So that's our ten dharma realms. Six mortal paths, four beyond samsara. Okay, interesting verse. Check this out. This is a really interesting verse. Just the way a magician conjures up all kinds of things of different shapes and features, and yet it's all illusory, the Bodhisattva's wisdom magic in the same way brings everything into being, neither existing nor not existing. Now that's mystical, right? That's an interesting passage. Look at that. 
what part of what we're going through is the Bodhisattva's wisdom magic? Hmm. Chinese, please. Piru huan shi zuo zhong shi. Zhong zhong xing xiang jie fei shi. So, here we go. Just like the illusion master doing his act, many kinds of shapes and appearances, none of which are shi, my name, shi, none of which are real. Pusa zhi huan yi ru shi. The bodhisattva's wisdom illusions are just like that. Sui xian yi qie li yo wu. Although they appear, every one of them is neither existent nor non-existent. You ready for that one? Chew on that one, right? It's like, what are my choices? If they don't exist and they don't not exist, is there a third path, right? Yeah, it's called the Madhyamika, the middle way. That's a powerful verse right there. And that goes beyond Charles Wesley's hymns, I must say. There's no Methodist hymn that touches that in terms of depth and insight. Okay, end of song. As these millions of beautiful sounds finished their praises of the Buddha, they stopped. All of the instruments quit. Moon of Liberation, who is the, what's called the interlocutor, he's the, the questioner of Vajra Treasury, says, okay, our group has done our bit. We're ready. We're waiting. Please tell us about the ninth stage. Okay. Now, before this, it was not so simple. The beginning, before the first ground, the first stage, Moon of Liberation said, we want to hear about it. Vajra Treasury said, uh-uh. <laughs> they had to beg three times, and then the Buddha had to intervene. The Buddha said, it's okay, it's okay, you can explain it. They're, they can handle it. Only then did Vajra Treasury go, well, against my better judgment. <laughs> Why? He said, it's too subtle. They're going to hear it, not believe it, even slander it. Better not say it at all to keep them from creating the karma of slander. Interesting, huh? So, tension in the Buddhist Sutra, because the Bodhisattva's judgment of the audience is that they are They're not able to understand it. So don't tell them. It's too much for them. And the Buddha personally says, no, 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 you got to carry it on. Come on, Mr. Griot, sing the song. We want to hear our history. So he does. And now he's done it first, second, third, fourth, up to the ninth so far. But there's always kind of that tension. Maybe he's going to say, no, 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 you're not ready. No, nope. nope. he goes on. Good for him. Okay, coming up next week, the motive of a ninth stage bodhisattva, the motives, not motifs, but motives, why? Why do it? Why continue to nine these reasons? They're there on the page. I'm on page 57 now. Those are the, the inspiration, the motives for the Bodhisattva to continue to study and learn the ninth stage. Then I'm going to scroll down. I'm on page 59 now. Then there's an inventory of what this Bodhisattva is going to know as he progresses. And man, this gets far out. It's hard not to lose your way in this. We're going to go pretty rapidly through it the next couple weeks. The Bodhisattva knows the reality of, it says, reality of practices in particular. And then he knows the reality of dense thickets of the mind. We run into this weird formula of dense thickets. The Chinese is cholin, cholin, right? Dense thickets. How about that? 
There's a long list of, what is it talking about? My mind, the stuff I got in my mind that keeps me from being a Buddha. It's like a dense thicket trying to wander through the Queensland bush when it's really thick. Okay, so we're going to do that part. Then uh, we get the next thing that comes up are marks, xiang, characteristics. The Bodhisattva knows characteristics of the phenomenal world. What would it be? He knows how to set up a microphone. He knows the characteristics of a USB microphone, right? And the Bodhisattva knows the characteristics of a guitar capo, how to use what it, how a guitar capo should work and how to use it to prop up the pitch. And the Bodhisattva knows the characteristics of a wristwatch, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And it applies it to people's minds. The Bodhisattva knows how minds work. And it's, it's an inventory, it's a list of all the things that this Bodhisattva is going to be able to use to teach on the ninth stage. How about that? How cool is that? Okay, coming up, coming up. Then there's specific teaching. Then there's something really, truly magical about the ninth stage. And it has to do with Dharani, with sound. So, okay, I'm pretty much done. I bet somebody in Berkeley has a question that they're just burning to ask. And you've been sitting there waiting for me to be quiet. So you could raise your hand, Jin Chuan could hand you the mic, and you could ask your question. Am I right? I was right. Here's our question. Hi. Hi, Dark Master. Hi there. Um, well, it wasn't, it, it was not too pressing, but I wanted to ask this like when you were still here, but the occasion never arose. And then you mentioned slandering at the end of this lecture. And then that, um, it brought up this question again. And it was like about a student who was looking through my bag and she pulled out the Dharma notes and it had the Avatamsaka quotes in it. And she's like, <laughs> she looked at it, she's like, this is stupid. And then she just threw it like back in my bag. And I was like thinking, oh no, she like slandered the sutra. And then I know it wasn't her intention to slander like, the Avatamska Sutra, but she did call it stupid. So, like, what's her consequences? Like, is it going to be heavy or is it going to be like, is it based on intention? Because I don't <sighs> think it's her intentions to, like, you know, slander. Okay. Know okay. Thoughts? So, the question, your, your question for me is what's going to happen? Yeah. Like, is she, like, going to have to face heavy consequences or is it going to be, like, whatever? Okay. Okay, good question. So this is Connie, and Connie's question is, you, you correct me if I got it wrong. She says uh, a friend of hers was going through her bag once and pulled out her notes from an Avatamsaka lecture. And she was going through the notes, and she went, huh, this is stupid, and threw the notes back into the bag. And so Connie, being conscientious, wants to know what bad things are going to happen to her friend given that her friend had no intention of slandering, but that that was a, an immediate response was, this is stupid. Is that, a, is that correct? Yeah, Connie? that sounds right. <laughs> okay. <coughs> well, she might turn out to be a Dharma master. <laughs> um, 1972, Berkeley Hills, living in my studio apartment as a graduate student at Cal, my former college roommate, now a Buddhist monk, Hung Yo Fasher, sent me copies of Vajra Bodhisi, the monthly periodical of the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association. And I opened up our magazine, which has, you know, sutras in it, Master Hua's Dharma talks in it. And I saw these pictures of the first five Americans to leave home and become monks and nuns. And I remember looking at it and going, what a bunch of crap, and threw it against the wall. <laughs> Tossed it across the room. 
this is phony, I said. And now when I think back on it, I mean, it was like, gulp, probably not a good thing to do. But that was my spontaneous response, was looking at, at, the, at the faces of these Americans in robes and thinking, can't be real, right? I chucked Vajrabodhisi across the room. And look what happened to me. Obviously suffering intense penalties for that mistake. So I don't know. Uh, I would hope that um, clearly your friend was not trying to cause herself trouble or I think the slander that the sutras are talking about is when you intentionally try to discourage other people from investigating the Dharma. I think that's what slander means. So it's not so much that she herself encountering something like uh, the, uh, the, the, the Dharma of the Buddhas neither exists nor it doesn't exist. Somebody could easily look at that and go, nonsense. What, there's only two choices. It either exists or it doesn't. Why, you know, what's this silly stuff? That's one thing. But if instead you say nobody should study Buddhism because it's a lot of garbage and it will cause you nothing but grief and confusion, so don't study it, right? That's slander. So now that I've said it on, you know, worldwide television, so intention matters a lot in saying what's going to go wrong. I would never put myself out there and say to you, Connie, therefore your friend is in big trouble and this is going to happen. I don't know. Judging by what you presented, uh, that was a fairly innocent and honest response to her uh, lack of context of, you know, what she was touching. The Avatamsaka is not for everybody. For example, the famous event in the Lotus Sutra assembly. They say, the Buddha is still explaining Fahajing on Vulture Peak <coughs> when he said, All you have to do in order to become a Buddha is to raise one hand in salute to a Buddha image or say Namo Buddha one time, and you too will become a Buddha. When the Buddha said that, 5,000 of his disciples stood up and walked out, grumbling, saying, you told us we had to take the precepts, we had to change our lives, we had to stop eating meat, we had to give up drinking beer, and we went through all that, and we're still not Buddhas, and you say, now all we have to do is like raise one hand in a salute and we become Buddhas, you lied to us, bummer, why did you cheat us like that? And they walked out. So, the Avatamsaka is not for everybody. I can easily see how people would say, you know, no, this is stupid. So a lot of it is intention. Now, if she goes on to like post on her Instagram account, nobody should read the Avatamsaka Sutra. My friend Connie's notes are stupid. You can encourage her to take it down or something. But just to, to respond that way, not a big deal. Okay. Thank then, you. Master. you know, bring her to a lecture. And after she listens to a lecture and she still says it's stupid, then it's on me. Um, then that's my fault. She's like 13. Her parents probably won't let her come yet. <laughs> Say what? Her parent. She's like 13, so she would need permission. She's 13. Yeah, come on. Thank you, Dharma Master. Okay. Uh, any more? We got a minute. Two minutes. Somebody? Okay. This is Jerry. I have yeah. a question. Yeah, Jerry. So you mentioned during the meditation uh, lecture, people, uh, you mentioned, so for the thoughts coming out from the mind, we treat it as a sensors, you know, one of a sense, and just let it go. Mm. So does that mean where those thoughts coming up is different than the consciousness? Where you 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 contemplate if you follow those thoughts or not. 
So meaning that one mind is not just one. So there's one the popping out thoughts. And then there's another thing that's consciousness, which is probably the self. Okay. And the question is? I always thought it's... The, I thought my and conscious is one thing, meaning the brain. Okay. Where you pop up the thoughts and also what you contemplate, those thoughts is one entity. Okay. So, Jerry, um, let me paraphrase what Jerry's question. He's, he, is, he says uh, in meditation class today, we, uh, I advocated treating the mind as just another sense. And Jerry's question is, has to do with the, he's challenging that and saying the mind has more. It has consciousness. And as thoughts pop up, that is consciousness responding. Um, and are they not, shouldn't that be considered one thing? So, Jerry, um, my my attempt at in meditation class was certainly a simplification. It was, I want to say oversimplified, it was simplified. What I was going for was trying to shrink heads, to become a head shrinker. That was the, head shrinker is a colloquial way of referring to a psychotherapist or a psychoanalyst, right? You, you call him a shrink. I went to see my shrink who shrinks your head. You go in and your head is full of confusion and you come out and things are clear. Your mind is less heavy, less confused. That was the idea. And meditation, it's not wrong to say that as we meditate, if we respond to the thoughts that rise, the same way we respond to the sights that occur to our eyes, we will have accomplished what I was hoping meditators might recognize. As an answer to the question, what are we supposed to be doing while we meditate? Or, I shouldn't be thinking, right? That's the, the question that I get a lot. The Sixth Patriarch says, I think a lot when I meditate in answer to that question. My mind is always thinking. So, Jerry, you're taking, you're challenging it more deeply than I put it to begin with. All right, yeah, the mind is, one of the questions that arose today was, what about when you're sleeping? Is that, it, how do you deal with the mind then? And I said, okay, what about when you're dreaming when you're sleeping? How do you deal with, you know? So clearly there's layer upon layer upon layer to investigate. But the, there's a fundamental principle that I find really helpful in meditation, which is whatever rises in the mind ceases in the mind. Don't take it from me, test it yourself. No matter whether it's a thought of grief, mourning for the loss of something dear to you, whether it's a thought of fear of something coming up that you're anticipating trouble arising, whatever, you can't handle it, whether it's a thought of joy from a peak experience, every single one of those thoughts will rise and fall. There's a guest function and a host function, and a meditator is the host observing thoughts rising, falling. Check it out. So you're asking a deeper question than I was answering with that statement, Jerry. Okay? You satisfied with that? Uh, yeah, thank you. There's, there's way more than my simple statement. Uh, Winnie had her hand up here. Winnie had a question. It's past time. It's okay, you're legit. We'll give you a... A pass. Uh, the last paragraph we read. Okay. Moon of Liberation said, now this multitude has been purified. 
So does that mean all the praising is purifying the assembly? Does that all the praises are purifying the assembly? Okay. Winnie's question was in the last sentence uh, spoken by Moon of Liberation, Chietoye Pusa. He said all these in the assembly have been purified. Does that mean the praises have were enough to purify all the assembly? That's a really good question. And no, it's not. It's that nobody has left since the eighth and the seventh and the sixth and the fifth and the fourth. They're glued to their seats. And one of the topics that came up in the first, that first go round was really significant when Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva said, no, I'm not going to explain this text. No way. You guys are too dense, too coarse. And it took the Buddha saying, no, they're fine. They're, they're ready. They can. They are able to digest and use what you're going to teach. They're pure enough. So that has happened already. So he's just, he's not talking about just what happened immediately. He's talking about the, what is, you know, the other aspect, the other stages that have been lectured. Yeah. Okay. Jin Chuan, Jin Wei, Jin Fo, sure. What's going on at Berkeley? Do you want to give us some announcements for everybody? The Chan sessions are over. The Amitabha sessions are over. What's coming up? Please speak nice and loudly so we can hear you here in Australia. Do you have any announcements? Oh, well, the Chan session's over and DRBU is starting up its semester. I'm not sure. Okay. Are most of our classes starting up at the same time? Or, once again, I think Jing Wei knows the exact schedule. Okay, here comes Jing Wei Shu. Yep. Uh, my, war, my mic doesn't work. So, uh, uh, we already. Uh, the classes, class uh, Wednesday class, Stephen Tainer already started. We have two already meetings, so the Wednesday class is going on, 7.30 p.m. Wednesday class has begun. Okay. Great. Uh, tomorrow we have Theravada nuns from Karuna Vihara, I guess. In the Theravada nuns from Karuna Vihara are coming tomorrow, right. Sunday. Five o'clock is tea and Dhamma, 7.30 is uh, meditation and Dhamma reflections. It's called Women Sharing Dharma, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We have Thursday night class, uh, Berkeley Insight Meditation Community, like always, 7.30 on Thursdays. Thursday night is the Spirit Rock East Bay Meditation Insight Community. So we don't know yet when uh, Professor Marty Verhoeven will start his uh, series of classes of Six Patriarch Sutra on Fridays. We'll announce that, but I don't think so. It will be next coming Friday. Friday. So Six Patriarch Lecture will be coming up. Stay tuned. Right. Okay. And uh, next important uh, announcement is that next Saturday we'll start our, our ordinary uh, gathering. Uh, in the in the, in, here in BBM in the morning, 9 a.m. Right, will be Pum and Pim Universal Door Chapter. Right, and will be okay. like always. So uh, uh, next Saturday, the Berkeley Monastery regular schedule will be back in session. Right, uh, there will be open lunch and uh, Amitabha Buddha recitation after that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we'll hear about living beings dense thickets on Saturday night. Right. Great. And also maybe Alrighty. one more is if people are interested, I think the second Saturday of every month, we're going to have the Buddhist uh, Berkeley Storytelling Circle. Led by yes, Brian the Storytelling Curry. Circle. We just had a gathering today and that was really fun. Uh, Brian told a story and then the, the rest of the group worked on different storytelling skills and some shared stories they prepared. So that should be really fun. Uh, thing <clears throat> okay, I want to repeat that. We can't quite hear here. Uh, today at Berkeley on Saturday, they had Brian Conroy, our storytelling teacher, share another class of our Buddhist Berkeley Monastery Buddhist Storytelling Circle. That's a, a weekly event. Two weeks, every other week, right? Uh, once a month. We're doing once a month. Once Saturday a month. Saturday of every and month. Brian is... Uh, 
has been teaching storytelling as a discipline at San Jose State University, at uh, high schools, elementary schools, and nationally among storytelling circles for years. And he is now uh, sharing that knowledge and inspiring people to learn how to tell stories and how to hear stories. So it's a wonderful event and people should pay attention to that. And we are starting the semester in Derbyu, right? On this coming Tuesday, the all classes will start again. This coming Tuesday, Dharma and Buddhist University classes will begin. Okay. Semester is in session. Lovely. Just okay. A... Happy 2019. We're back. Let's hope the government is, is in session soon. Okay. Can we transfer the merit? Mm -hmm. Those of you who have got dedication of merit available put your hearts into it let your mind be like empty space have your thoughts fall still and share a sincere wish to transfer this merit everywhere here we go as one and radiant with light. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, May our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light Dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and okay, a special appreciation for those folks who kindly put this out into the world. Our engineers, Jerry and Alan and Yuan Lin and uh, Yi Huan in Berkeley and Cliff and Sam translating for China. Everybody whose efforts, did I leave anybody out in Berkeley behind the computer there? Locke, Locke helped out a lot. Locke is there. Yes, Locke is the teacher of all of us. Okay, thank you all. See you all next week. Omitofo. Bye-bye.